Uh, as Kate mentioned, I'm the Global Director for Water Process Engineering for Moliere. Uh, I've been with the company for four years. Uh, prior to working for Moliere, I worked as a consultant with CDM Smith uh, doing wastewater treatment process design, specializing in biological process modeling, secondary treatment systems, and aeration systems. Um, so I'm very excited to, after four years of development, have something that I can speak to with confidence and share these um, very remarkable findings that we're having here with nanobubble treatment. So here we have um, a slide that just shows the breadth of the applications that we have here at Moliere. So we have over 2,000 projects, uh, even more installations if you go on the number of nanobubble generators. And they're spread across a, a variety of industries um, with one thing in common, which is water. So anything that touches water, uh, we can generally use nanobubbles to improve water quality or in, in um, instances where we're growing food, like crops or fish, uh, to, to increase the yields. And then we are also moving into uh, chemical manufacturing, oil and gas, and the mining space as well. But today I'm just going to be focusing on wastewater and wastewater treatment. So here's an overview of the water cycle. Uh, just to give everybody an idea, at least in the constructed environment, uh, where water um, comes from that enters into the wastewater treatment plant. So you can see here, we have water coming in from stormwater systems. Sometimes we have water coming in from collection systems that's taking it from industrial uh, manufacturers or even residential homes, uh, university schools, hospitals, um, you name it, coming down to the wastewater treatment plant here, uh, which is your typical conventional activated sludge configuration. Uh, in this case includes a primary clarifier. Um, it doesn't have to include primary clarifier for what I'm gonna be talking about today, uh, but is shown here as options. So if you get nothing else out of the presentation today, uh, what I'd like you to take away is that nanobubbles can be used to reduce the cost to treat wastewater, and that's in dollars per gallon uh, here in the US. Um, we're looking at lowering the O&M as well as the capital cost for treating the wastewater uh, by increasing treatment capacity through wastewater treatment intensification and overall providing better water quality more efficiently, uh, so lowering the cost um, associated with chemical consumption, uh, power uh, consumption, and things of that nature. And so focusing in here on these red boxes is what we call nanobubble pretreatment. So nanobubble pretreatment generally requires screened raw wastewater, and that injection location for injecting the nanobubbles can be anywhere from the headworks to if there's a primary equalization tank, we can inject at those locations. The channels in between uh, these structures also can work. Uh, really just looking for open access where we can pull wastewater from a basin or channel, recirculate it through a nanobubble generator and return it back uh, upstream of a biological process. And by upstream, I mean before the return activated sludge is added back into the process. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, focusing only on nanobubble pretreatment. If you're interested in any of these other applications or potentially where nanobubbles can be applied at different locations uh, within the water cycle, feel free to reach out to Davey. Um, he will be able to either address your questions directly or connect you with somebody within the company that focuses on that specific application. Uh, here's an overview of the technology. Uh, the technology is rather simple in concept. It is what we consider the nanobubble generator or sometimes referred to as the core technology. It requires the liquid to be pumped through the core technology and it requires a gas source. Uh, the gas source is a low gas flow compared to what you may be, um, you may be associated with 
uh, in terms of like an aeration system. So we're generally looking at pressures in the range of 30 to 40 PSIG and gas flows on the order of SCFH instead of SCFM. Uh, we can use plant air, for example, and plant air is available. So you take the pump, you pump the water through the cortex, you add your gas supply, and then the hydraulic conditions within the core technology produce very small nanobubbles on the range of 100 nanometers in diameter, uh, and they inject those into the flowing liquid. So what are nanobubbles? So uh, nanobubbles have been evaluated within the scientific community for probably about 20 years now. Uh, they've, they've been around forever. They were first discovered in crashing waves in the ocean. So they are naturally occurring. It just hasn't been until the last 20 years or so that the technology to uh, measure and study nanobubbles has been available. Uh, and, and now we are also able to produce equipment that can replicate those effects of the crashing waves by controlling the hydraulic conditions to produce high concentrations of nanobubbles. And that's really where the value that we see um, is provided. So you can see on this scale, we're used to fine bubbles when we talk about things like diffusers and blower systems. Um, coarse bubbles would be even larger. Micro bubbles would be what you would associate with white water in something like a dissolved air flotation or saturation chamber. And then nanobubbles down here at a much smaller range of approximately 100 nanometers in diameter, we're getting close to the size of viruses and bacteria at that scale. And so at that scale, they actually behave quite differently than all other bubbles. Uh, they behave more uh, as you would think of as chemistry or, or chemicals, because uh, they are nano-sized particles and they have special properties. And so here we list some of those properties and behaviors of the nanobubbles. Um, some are unique to the nanobubbles, um, some are shared, but um, for example, like the negative surface charge, you'll find a negative surface charge on a larger bubble. Uh, but it won't be as strong as the negative surface charge that's on the nanobubble. And that's just a function of the size. So as you get smaller in size and you get to the nanoscale, you start to see different behavior, such as Brownian motion. So the bubbles are following now Brownian motion, which is a random motion rather than uh, rising to the surface and bursting like you would find larger bubbles. Uh, you also find that they have a very high internal pressure and that high internal pressure along with their negative surface charge, makes them electrochemically active. So they can start to participate in reactions and um, degrade contaminants that larger bubbles won't be able to interact with. Specifically, there's a class of compounds within wastewater, which you will soon see you're all familiar with, uh, but they fall under the category or uh, classification of amphiphilic and amphiphilic pathic molecules. Uh, specifically in wastewater, we look at fats, oils, grease, and surfactants, and those are the molecules that we'll focus on uh, for removing from these waste streams using nanobubbles. And these molecules are um, categorized as such because they have a hydrophilic head group and a hydrophobic tail group. And what that means is that when they're in water, they tend to get entrained in water. And so a lot of times when you hear about these colloidal materials or the other challenges that are caused from um, materials that pass through various types of treatment processes that are hard to treat or hard to remove or cause various problems within an activated sludge process, those molecules tend to be these uh, amphiphilic or amphipathic molecules. And the nanobubbles, like I mentioned, the surface of them is also hydrophobic. And so you'll get this hydrophobic attraction between the nanobubbles, which I'll show here on another slide, and these molecules. So they'll actually line up around the surface of the nanobubbles. And when they, um, when they do that, when the nanobubble collapses, it releases that internal pressure and that internal pressure is quite high. It actually is released in the form of, of heat. Uh, and it also is sufficient to create the hydroxyl radical. And so those two mechanisms lead to what is known as thermal oxidative degradation. So it's actually able to oxidize and degrade contaminants that are within a localized close proximity of the bubble, which happens to be these compounds of the fats, oils, grease, and surfactants. So fats, oils, grease, and surfactants contribute to BOD and or COD. 
or I should say COD and or BOD. Um, some of these compounds are readily biodegradable and those ones are gonna show up in your BOD. And some of them are not readily biodegradable uh, and those will definitely be showing up in your COD as well. Uh, so you're already measuring these at the facilities. It's just not necessarily being measured um, out to uh, the water quality parameters of surfactants, for example. So these uh, constituents are one of the main inhibitors of the activated sludge process, and that's because of their ability to coat surfaces. So at the water surface, for example, inside of a gravity pipe or a basin, they'll tend to accumulate, uh, as this shows here, this would be the water surface. So their hydrophilic head wants out of the water, their hydrophobic tail or the hydrophobic head is in the water, the hydrophobic tail ends up getting a chain of water molecules that is built around it and they actually get trapped and entrained in that um, water. So it's very difficult to remove them. So as they accumulate like this, you can imagine at the surface of the water, they actually impede the transfer of oxygen into that water body. So the natural surface transfer that should be happening across process units is not happening. And that's why you see things like when you have a lot of scum developing on a primary clarifier, you may experience subsidy or odor, same thing as an equalization tank which will ultimately uh, lead to corrosion and other challenges. So getting these materials out of the water uh, enables the dissolved oxygen to transfer from the surface of these water bodies to start to prevent some of these conditions. They also coat solids and they emulsify wastewater. Uh, one of the uses for surfactants is actually for emulsification. And so you, when you start to get concentrations that are high enough of these materials and you're emulsifying the wastewater, you can have poor solid separation across um, solid separating units such as uh, dissolved air flotation, uh, primary and secondary clarifiers. Another fact about these is that their compounds are slowly biodegradable. So they are a carbon source. Um, but they're very hard for the bacteria to get at. The biomass prefers readily biodegradable carbon. And so you'll end up with a less efficient uh, biological process because your bacteria is working so hard to try and get the carbon from these slowly biodegradable sources. And one of the things that we've observed, which I'll go in on another slide with the nanobubbles is that as they oxidize these slowly biodegradable compounds, they're actually breaking them down into a readily biodegradable form, which is then improving the kinetics for uh, these biological processes. So they also, in addition to coating solids, will coat air bubbles, such as those from your fine bubble aeration system, which will then impede the transfer of oxygen to that water body. Uh, this is often captured in the alpha factor. And so if you have a lot of surfactants in the waste stream, you'll have a lower alpha factor, meaning that you have to apply more oxygen. So larger blowers, more diffusers uh, to transfer um, the, or to meet the oxygen demand of the system because these materials are uh, interfering with the transfer from the bubbles from the aeration system. So in addition to coating the biomass and creating other issues related to separating solids um, and their ability to uptake the carbon, they also impede the transfer of oxygen through the biomass. So by removing these materials, you can maintain a more aerobic uh, biomass, which is important in some processes, uh, especially looking at nitrification processes. And then they can also be toxic to the bacteria. So some of these surfactants are widely used in disinfecting chemicals, uh, both industrial and household um, strength chemicals. And they tend to be uh, especially toxic to nitrifiers, resulting in lower uh, kinetics. And, and this you will see expressed as uh, poor nitrogen removal efficiency or move ammonia removal rates, for example. Uh, and then lastly, because they're only partially removed by physical and biological processes, they will pass through the facility, uh, you know, slowly biodegradable, um, unless you have an extended uh, aeration process, is it's going to take so long for these materials to break down that if they pass into the natural environment, uh, they will end up breaking down in the natural environment and then they'll end up consuming the dissolved oxygen in those receiving waters. Uh, with one caveat, 
except when you're using a strong oxidant like chlorine for disinfection, in which case they will be oxidized by your disinfection system, but they will cause you to have a higher chemical consumption rate or a higher demand uh, than, than what would be necessary if you're able to get these materials out. So I think fat soils and grease are pretty self-explanatory as to where those materials come from in wastewater. So I'm choosing to just look at surfactants here because this tends to be the one where um, maybe people don't realize just how broadly they're applied. So surfactants are in all of our detergents from laundry to dishwasher detergents, our degreasers, our personal care products like our shampoos and our body wash, and then our cleaning and disinfection processes or products. Uh, there's four types, um, generally classified as cationic, anionic, non-ionic, and zwitterionic. So cationic having your positive charge. These includes your quaternary ammonium compounds, which are used a lot uh, for disinfecting surfaces, especially uh, in meat and poultry and dairy, uh, as well as uh, facilities like universities and hospitals. Um, anywhere where uh, disinfection is really important uh, for maintaining a safe product or maintaining public safety, they are using a lot of these quaternary ammonium compounds. And as they wash down their surfaces, these um, substances end up in the collection system and then at the treatment facility. Anionic being your negatively charged, non-ionic being uh, neutral, and zwitterionic having uh, both a negative and positive charge. Uh, zwitterionic we don't see very much, um, so those ones are, are specialty, really just used in really specific industries. Uh, so most of what we look at within wastewater is going to fall under the cationic, anionic, and non-ionic. So over the last several years, um, and even starting back at the you know, 20 years ago, at the beginning of my career, I worked in Arizona. I remember talking about concentrating waste streams for some of these same reasons. Uh, so why are surfactants or why are waste streams concentrating over time? Um, well, a lot of it has to do with different factors that are going on in our environment uh, and, and then um, just changes in human habits. So uh, we've switched from using bar soaps to using a lot of liquid soaps and liquid products uh, that has contributed to a lot more surfactants coming into our wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, the pandemic is a big one. You can imagine the use of these disinfection chemicals uh, and, and how much more prevalently they've been used um, since the pandemic. And then also uh, with the scares around contamination of food sources, such as lettuce recalls, a lot of uh, industries um, of food producers are using these products uh, as a, a means of protecting themselves from the liability associated with uh, foodborne illness. We also have less water being used uh, per person, and, and this is something that's been ongoing, and um, you know, different regs have come out at different times and different building codes to try and address water conservation. So we see water conservation still happening at levels that uh, we could not have imagined before in response to drought. Um, and then also the switch from all of our old appliances, which were very water intensive to high efficiency appliances. And then improvements to our collection systems, um, especially in the reduction of uh, inflow and infiltration. And this is all resulting in the concentrating of contaminants, which include fat soils, grease, and surfactants in the waste streams that are being treated by our facilities. And the last one that I put on here, because it's often overlooked and sometimes is hard to manage because it can be uh, from an illegal um, source, are chemical toilet waste. So waste that's coming out of planes, buses, RVs, porta potties, um, things of those natures, vac trucks, uh, will often contain some extremely toxic uh, chemicals that fall under the category of surfactants. Uh, so surfactants in wastewater treatment process um, and, and how they're interacting with the nanobubbles. I have this um, graphic here on the left, uh, which shows conceptually what it would look like with the nanobubble uh, as the gas core, and then these materials lining up around here with their 
hydrophilic heads pointed outward and their hydrophobic tails pointed towards the hydrophobic source uh, surface of the nano bubble. Uh, so there's a hydrophobic force attraction is what is bringing these within proximity and causing them to line up. And this is the same structure that you'll see with surfactants um, known as the me cell. So in the absence of the nano bubbles, these molecules will actually do this um, with no nano bubble in the center. But when you give the nano bubble gives another surface for them to line up around, it'll put them in the same configuration around the outside of these. So bring it in within close proximity to give that localized effect. As I mentioned with the bubble burst, it's going to break apart these molecules, um, removing them, uh, degrading them. And so specifically looking here, there's a, a few different molecules that fall into this uh, family that I discussed earlier with the amphiphilic amphipathic. Uh, they include phospholipids, polymers, and proteins, but we're specifically looking today at surfactants and fat soils in Greece. And so by getting these substances out of the waste streams, we can lower the cost to treat, uh, reducing both CAPEX and OPEX. Uh, we can provide wastewater treatment intensification, so you can actually uh, use your existing infrastructure to treat uh, more load. You can, or you can look at it a different way. You can increase your treatment capacity of an existing infrastructure. And be resulting also, if it's a new construction, you would be resulting in smaller process units and the ancillary equipment to support those units and improved energy efficiency, improved removal efficiencies, less chemical usage associated mostly with your disinfection systems, um, as well as potentially ferric um, and other chemicals that may be used, such as polymer. And, and then overall, we're looking to provide best in class removal and energy efficiency for wastewater treatment using nanobubble pretreatment. So going back to what we were talking about with the COD, and you could replace COD with BOD here, um, what we do when we're designing a wastewater treatment process is we look at the different types of COD or BOD that's in the waste stream, and that helps us to determine which process units to use to treat that waste stream. And so we look specifically through doing what is known as COD fractionation or influent wastewater characterization. We want to understand how much of that COD is inert and particulate. Those are the ones that are going to be removed by separation processes. We have inert and soluble. That's going to pass through the plant unless you're getting into advanced water treatment. And then we have slowly biodegradable, uh, which as we noted, it's only partially removed. Oftentimes it's removed with the biomass, coating the biomass. And so if you have uh, anaerobic digester, for example, you're basically transferring these materials from your liquid stream to your solid stream, and then they're going to create similar level of chaos within your anaerobic process. Uh, and then the readily biodegradable, which is the easiest to treat, and it's what the biological process is designed to treat. Um, especially when it's in the soluble form. Um, so without nanobubbles, um, what we're finding is that, you know, you have your typical um, COD fractionation, and then when you inject your nanobubbles, what we're seeing is that the slowly biodegradable portion is being degraded to readily biodegradable. Uh, and so all of the values that I'm about to show you on some of these projects are the direct result of converting the slowly biodegradable to readily biodegradable. And so how we do that, um, we have a mobile lab that we deploy to uh, customer sites where we're either piloting or we're trying to get information uh, if it's you know something we haven't done before and we want to get some advanced information to assist with sizing uh, that could be another application for the mobile lab uh, but generally deploying it where we're doing a demonstration pilot project so that we can dig more into the COD fractionation uh, and the effects of nanobubble pretreatment to gain a better understanding of why we're seeing what we're seeing in the field. Uh, and so within the mobile lab is everything that we need in order for us to collect fresh wastewater samples and conduct the COD fractionation on site. Uh, because what we've found is when we go through third party labs that we're not able to get the quality data that we need to be able to gain the level of understanding that we're looking to gain. 
So this is this is like fresh off the press, hot off the press. I got this this morning. We have a project in Copenhagen, Denmark. This installation just went in like a couple of weeks ago. And uh, half of our team is out there currently on site visiting this facility and other facilities. But they sent me some pictures, so I figured I should put them in here, give you some more context. So this is a 20 MGD um, treatment facility in Copenhagen. Um, they are injecting nanobubbles on the primary clarifier. They're using what we call the NBG6, which is just Moliere's name for the core technology. Uh, and they have two of them operating in series. They have this pump, which I'm told is a submersible pump that's installed on its side, which I guess makes more sense because I was trying to figure that out this morning. But they have a pump it's pulling from the um, after the scum is removed from rectangular primary clarifiers and injecting right back into the same location. So this is a little bit different um, than what I showed earlier. This is this is our first time actually injecting on a primary clarifier. Um, so far, so good. Uh, they have two of their nano bubble generators in series here. Uh, that's returning the waste, um, the, the nanobubble treated wastewater back to the primary clarifier. And this is really what I wanted to show you guys is they have eight primary clarifiers, but they started out with just treating one, um, you know, they're, everybody's learning in real time because this technology is so new. Uh, and what we saw within just, you know, a few days of operation, you have the primary clarifier that's receiving the nanobubbles here, a primary clarifier that's not receiving the nanobubbles here. They all looked similar um, to start. This has about, you know, four to five inches of scum. That's your fats, oils, and grease, and, you know, all the problems associated with that with the poor oxygen transfer and the odors and the subsidy and um, the issues with the solids going septic. And here you see with the nanobubbles that those materials are being oxidized and removed. And the interesting thing to me is that with where these are being injected, uh, they're being injected at one location, but it really shows the dispersion of the nanobubbles throughout the basin to effectively treat the entire surface. It's not just the localized effects, but they are actually spreading out as you would expect with the Brownian motion from the bubbles. And this project, I have a lot more data on um, that I wanted to share with you here. This is the Goleta Sanitation District uh, Water Reclamation or Water Resource Recovery Facility. Uh, this is in Goleta, California. It's in the Central Coast. Uh, they have a hydraulic treatment capacity or permit capacity of nine and a half MGD. They're currently treating 4.2 MGD, average annual dry, dry weather flow. Um, they have a very high strength wastewater, and that's largely due to the impacts of drought and water conservation in this area. Uh, and as a consequence to that, even though they are not near their hydraulic loading limit, uh, they are very close to their organic and solids loading limit here at the facility. So this one is actually operating at capacity. Um, the treatment plant operator, uh, the operations superintendent for this facility has been aware of the impacts of surfactants uh, since 2016. Uh, in fact, they did a, a big study where they identified uh, some sources within their collection system from industrial users. One was the airport and the dumping of the, um, the toilet waste from the airplanes, that chemical waste. Uh, was causing problems at their facilities. They were able to eliminate those contributors and their issues seemed to get better. But then in 2020, the pandemic hit and they have a large uh, contribution of their wastewaters from uh, UCSB, University of California, Santa Barbara, and there, as well as hospitals and other such facilities in the area, which started using a lot more of these disinfecting products. And so come 2020, they had all of their problems return and they were at a loss for how to resolve these issues. And their issues that they were, they were having process upsets where they were um, losing their ability to, to treat and to meet their, and to remain in compliance with their, their permits at times. Uh, and in March in 2022, their uh, operations superintendent found a, uh, 
TPO, the treatment plant operator magazine, and, and was flipping through it and came across a Moliere article about how um, nanobubbles were installed at another facility in Fallbrook, California to remove surfactants and was very excited as this was the only solution that he'd come across. Uh, so he contacted Moliere and got a unit installed this year in May and began treating on May 10th. And it's one nanobubble generator, six, uh, it's treating 2,700 gallons per minute. And it is installed post-screening and grit removal uh, before the primary clarifier. And in an interesting twist of fate, the operations superintendent also noticed that I had a job opening on my team and applied for it. And now he is working for Moliere. Uh, and he's actually one of the people that's in Denmark right now collecting data on that other treatment facility. And he's responsible for the design of that mobile lab and collecting our COD fractionation uh, testing. So he brought with him all of his knowledge from all of his research on surfactants and trying to uh, solve his own issues. Uh, and, and so together, collectively, we've learned a lot in a very short amount of time. So here's an overview of this facility. We've got a preliminary treatment here going on to primary clarifiers, so headworks, primary clarifiers, and then on to bio, biofilters. This is essentially trickling filter activated sludge plant. Um, and then on to your activated sludge process, then secondary clarifiers, and then over to the chlorine contact basin where the flow gets split. Some of the, most of the flow goes out here to ocean um, outfall. And then some of the flow gets diverted uh, for reclamation. So they do some additional uh, tertiary filtration and disinfection, and they use this reclaimed portion of this water to irrigate things like local golf courses and such. And then they also have their solids handling facility, uh, which includes anaerobic digestion. So here's uh, beautiful Goleta, California, what they don't show you behind here. I told him, I said, well, you don't, you sure you want to come here? You've already peaked where you're going to go from here. Behind here, what you can't see is the ocean. So if you turned, you know, 180 degrees, there's ocean views from the top of their headworks. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but here they have a self-priming pump rental. Uh, they have their NBG6 on plant air. Uh, so this is the core technology. This is what Moliere manufactures. Everything else is provided by others. You know, Moliere can assist with providing it when needed. Uh, we can also size a nanobubble generator based off of an existing pump, which is always our preference because then we're not adding energy to the system. But we're pulling out of a channel at the headworks, uh, sending the flow through the nanobubble generator and then returning it back into that channel. And here's just some information on, um, oh, I feel like I skipped a slide, hold on. Huh. Maybe it's after this one. Some information on some surfactant uh, data that we collected at Goleta. Uh, we looked at the three primary uh, types that we see in, in municipal wastewater and, and came up with this total. So the total concentration um, combined of these surfactants is around 12 milligrams per liter. And um, this is taken from Metcalf and Eddy, but it's 2007. And I suspect that these numbers might look a lot different today with all of the changes um, that have occurred with, with how uh, surfactants are finding their way into the collection system. But at this time, they said it's normal for typical for untreated wastewater to have a concentration before between four and 10. So you do see that we're slightly more concentrated than the typical range here from 2007. And then these other ones, just not to cause confusion, I'll explain these as well. Um, this is how much surfactants would pass through each one of these different processes. So what you would find in their effluent. Uh, indicating that obviously not all surfactants are being removed by the biological process. And then noting that within the biological process, some of the surfactants are readily biodegradable and could be removed that way. But a majority of the surfactants are binding with the biomass and are actually coming out with the sludge. Here's the slide I was looking for. Um, so here we have nanobubble pretreatment 
uh, and the effects of surfactant removal. So we basically did a mass balance across the primary clarifiers to see how much surfactant was being removed um, both, uh, on the raw wastewater upstream of the nanobubble generator uh, across the clarifier. So here we have our influent, which would be your raw wastewater before the nanobubble generator, then the nanobubbles are injected. And then this is your concentration of the effluent. And then this is the concentration in the sludge. And so what we found with the three types that we tested is that we're removing between 40 and 54% of the surfactants. And we looked at quaternary ammonium compounds um, since most of the cationic surfactants that you find in wastewater um, will be quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, whereas where we looked at the non-ionic and the anionic, uh, we looked at a, a lot of different types of surfactants. And so these are the totals for those. And so some visuals here, this is the equalization basin um, before nanobubble pretreatment. It was normal for them to see lots of foaming um, and have lots of odors. And at times the foam would be so much that it would cover all of the surface. So you can imagine that um, you're not getting very much oxygen transfer. You've got this large surface where oxygen should be naturally transferring in to help keep this wastewater fresh, uh, but that's not happening because it's being blocked by all of these surfactants and other materials. And then after nanobubble pretreatment, this is what it looks like now. Uh, they no longer have that stable foam that accumulates and their odors have been resolved. And then within the primary clarifier, what they observed was, uh, again, significant odor reduction. Um, that's just from keeping um, the sludge from going septic. And because of the effect of the nanobubbles, they're now able to operate multiple primary clarifiers uh, without risk of sepsicity, uh, which has really helped them a lot uh, in providing them some more flexibility with how they operate their sludge handling facilities. And they are seeing a uh, nice compact sludge with clear supernatant above the sludge, as you can see here. There's no evidence of denitrification or fermentation. And then with regards to the TSS removal efficiency, you see here, this is before nanobubble treatment. Um, they were on average, had a removal efficiency of about 69%, um, total, solid, total suspended solids removal. And then they started up their nanobubble generator. They immediately saw a 10% improvement. And so this goes into just getting some of those compounds out that caused the emulsification. And th that improvement was sustained throughout the pilot period. And so when you start removing these materials really far up into the treatment facility, you start to realize the benefits across multiple process units. So that was just across the primary clarifier we can now start to look at what improvements in the downstream process units uh, were realized because of the removal of these contaminants. Here we have the activated sludge aeration efficiency. So this is specifically with the blower power draw. You can see here before they have these big swings, these are actually process upsets. So what I learned from John and his work at Goleta and all of his data analysis was when they received these high loads of surfactants that were toxic to their biomass, they're blower power draw actually drops. And that's the toxicity effect. And then as those upsets resolve, then the power draw comes back up. And so on the day that the nanobubble generator was started up, they saw a 22% decrease in their blower power draw. Now they have DO control with flow control valves and uh, turbo blowers. So they have very efficient uh, aeration system to begin with, with lots of controls. And, th and that is an important factor to take into consideration uh, because the amount of energy that you can reclaim will be uh, directly related to how your system is configured. But at this facility, they were able to immediately save 22%. And so that's attributed to the removal of the surfactants and the impact of those surfactants on, we can call it alpha factor, which is really your oxygen transfer rate. So 22% decrease just related to getting those materials out. And then we start to see another step change here. Approximately two to three um, SRT, so um, solid retention times, you end up replacing the biomass uh, 
naturally with a new biomass that was grown under nanobubble injection. And so the biomass that was in the reactors that was treating the wastewater during these conditions was acclimate, acclimated to all of these toxic surfactants and such. And you didn't have to have that same biomass after you removed those. So you see it get replaced with a more efficient biomass. And then you also see another 21% decrease in aeration energy efficiency for a total of 43%. And you see those process upsets, those swings are very tight now. So we're not really, they're not really experiencing those process upsets that they were experiencing before nanolevel injection. And then this one, let's see if I can get this video to play. We have uh, SVI, so this is in real time. This is not sped up at all. One of the things that we've noticed and has been noted in research by others are the, uh, the effect of nanobubbles on sludge settleability. And so at Goleta, with, they, are, they had fast settling sludge before, partially because they're a trickly filter activated sludge facility, uh, but they had an even faster settling sludge, uh, achieving 90% settle volume in less than two minutes. And um, before they were seeing um, SVIs of around 66, or I think this is after, but 66 within. 30 minutes. So very low, like borderlining, borderlining on uh, sludge densification is what they're observing. And it's actually one of the areas that we want to start researching next is to um, understand whether we are forming uh, granular sludge or not. Granulars. Let's see. Let's go to this next one. Okay. And then here, this is a demonstration with the data of the overall improvement in uh, water quality. So before nanobubbles, you see a divergence here between um, BOD and TSS, TSS here in blue, BOD in gray, um, showing that the process is less efficient. So because your BOD is greater than TSS, what we wanna see is that all of your BOD is basically converted to TSS and then it's removed by your secondary clarifiers. And so once the nanobubbles were started up, um, this goes back to converting the slowly biodegradable to readily biodegradable. You see the process improvements here. Um, where you, their uh, TSS and BOD values are coming into line with one another. And then after you replace the full uh, biomass within the aeration tank with the biomass that's been grown under nanobubbles, uh, you see they're tracking almost on top of each other, uh, indicating that it's a much more efficient uh, treatment process because you are converting your BOD to TSS and they're able to remove that with your secondary clarifiers. And then lastly, the chlorine contact basin. This was the surprise for me. I wasn't expecting to see this, um, but the data pretty much speaks for itself um, because those slowly biodegradable uh, contaminants uh, can be oxidized. They do consume chlorine. So once we started the nanobubble generator up, they saw a 10% decrease in their chlorine demand. And then after the three, two to three SRTs, they saw it come down by another 34% for a total of 44% decrease in chlorine demand, all because they were able to remove those organic contaminants from their vinyl effluent. And so going on to the permanent installation. So I showed you all the temporary installation with the rental pump. The rental pump is not very efficient. And so uh, they are switching to a flight submersible pump, which is going to reduce the power draw for the nanobubble generator system by half. Uh, this should be installed here in a couple more months. And what it will end up looking like is something along this. This is a concept layout. Uh, we've got the pump drawing suction from the channel, uh, post screens upstream of the primary clarifier, and then pumping through the nanobubble generator and returning it back to that same channel. And so what does all that mean in terms of dollars for Goleta? Uh, the reduction 
in the net energy. So the total blower power savings less the pump energy from the pump required for the net bubble generator is $32,000 a year. Reduction in uh, disinfection chemicals, $15,000 a year. Elimination of the bio augmentation. So they were having to add, um, you know, de designer bacteria, specialty bacteria uh, during their upsets uh, to reseed uh, and maintain compliance with permits. They no longer have to do that. Uh, that was directly related to the surfactants that were coming into the facility. So that's going to save them $44,000 a year. And they can now operate with one treatment train from by removing one treatment train from service, um, which includes a trickling filter and the energy savings associated with that. Uh, that's due to wastewater treatment intensification uh, or uh, treatment capacity increase at $36,000 per year. So a total avoided cost of $127,000 per year. And that is OPEX, so O&M savings. And then also in addition to that, uh, they have an impending plant upgrade because there are nutrient regulations coming on the ocean discharge. Currently, they do not have a nutrient limit, but they do do partial nitrification. And what we've observed with the increase in capacity is that they are now able to come very close to being in compliance with what they believe that uh, impending nutrient regulation is going to be. And so that alone could save them up to $50 million in CapEx from not having to do a capital improvements project. So I know I threw a lot at y'all and appreciate everybody listening, but I'd like to open it up for questions.